as Brother Jonathan announced, our title is God Gave the Increase. You know, brethren, throughout God's Word, um, He gives us a lot of lessons, a lot of doctrines throughout the Scriptures, written Word. Some of them are deep. Some of them require a lot more study. Uh, some of them a lot, a lot more uh, discussion and research. Some of them are simpler. Some of them are more basic. But the basic ones are just as important as the deep ones because we have to learn how to apply all these things in our lives. Um, I am putting this in the category of a more fundamental study, but adhering to Brother Aaron Key Michael's advice, I asked a lot of questions. And I actually didn't even, he didn't even know that, but I did this when I wrote this talk. I have a lot of questions. And this discourse, this research, actually answered a lot of these questions. So I'm hoping that by taking his advice, that we will all get a valuable lesson out of this. We'll see. Our lesson comes from 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 6, and I will read it to you. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now, that's pretty straightforward. It's, a, uh, it's, it's basically a, a statement the Apostle Paul makes. Um, without belaboring the point, we realize that that increase is... God's Holy Spirit, the ability to understand the spiritual aspects of his plan. No, no secrets there. Um, Paul makes it in his statement, he implies it's a two-step process. You have the planting, you have the watering, and then of course the, the increase comes from the Heavenly Father. And I have to tell you, brethren, I have read this scripture as you probably have many a time in our past. And I just glanced over it. But then I started asking some questions mentally of my own. And I became not as comfortable with my understanding of this scripture. So I'll leave it at that. I don't say anything negative about the this, this, this statement itself, by no means. Nor am I saying anything about what the Apostle Paul gave us in, in, uh, in his uh, ministry in the service to God and the Holy Spirit, with the gospel. So let's just put that on a shelf for a minute. We'll come back to that. Of course, the Holy Spirit is indeed God's power, God's ability for us to understand it, especially at the end of this age. We don't see many signs of God's Holy Spirit um, uh, moving mountains literally or, or uh, the creation that's all done, but his Holy Spirit is definitely what guides us into the spiritual aspects of his plan. Um, Apostle Paul. It was said by one of our brethren earlier today, he was a very unique individual. Um, can't wait, if I'm faithful, I can't wait to meet him, besides a, a numerous other ones. But he, he was spectacular in some of the uh, things he was able to accomplish with his zealous, zealousness and his, his spirit, his character. Um, Apostle Paul, once he was changed on the road to Damascus and corrected into the right path, he literally hit the ground running. He took off and never stopped. He never looked back. He never missed an opportunity to preach this wonderful gospel and to minister to the, to the prospective saints. Um, we all are aware that he had taken several, I believe it was four missionary trips uh, abroad, which he did a lot by boat and, and by walking. And these were far. These were hundreds of miles away from his home. So he left the comfort of his home and to preach the gospel. And, and at first he did it. Well, not, not I shouldn't say that. He always did it with the intention of spreading the gospel and establishing this, this, these seeds in, in new brother. But he also went back to, to minister to the ecclesias that he had already set up. Now, you have to remember this too. The gospel was very new. It, it had been preached just a few years ago by our Lord. The first time that gospel was ever heard on the, on the earth was by our Lord. And then it was picked up by the apostles. So this, this gospel is very new. And what you have to remember is the apostle Paul did not only preach to the Jewish brethren, but he preached to the Gentile brethren. And there was a substantial difference. And we have to make, make, that, make ourselves aware of that. Typically, the Jewish brethren and the Jewish people believed in the God of Abraham, typically. Now, I say that because we know that down through time, uh, they had accepted many false doctrines into their, 
thought process, and, and, and it wasn't as pure as, as God had intended when he gave it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the Gentile people, completely opposite. They didn't believe in one God. They, they worshiped many gods. And this is the situation that we come across in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 3. They had, a, they had a little bit of difficulty separating what they used to know to what the gospel was. As everybody remember, well, it's probably remembered by everybody, probably one of the most well-remembered sermons that Apostle Paul ever gave, and it was the sermon on Mar Mars Hill, um, which was into the Greek, Greek area. It was the, he took advantage of the opportunity to uh, speak to the Greek people about the unknown God. Brother Russell sheds a lot of light on this, and it's, it was interesting. Uh, the Greek people at that time, they had worshipped multiple false gods. Uh, to them, they weren't false, of course, but they were false gods nonetheless. And they even realized that they had so many that they had to put a limit on it. And, and whether it was the government or some group inside their people, they said, okay, we're going to limit this, and we're going to limit it, and according to Brother Russell, was, we're going to limit it at 50 gods. No more. 50 is enough. But just in case. We're going to leave one of those gods without a name just in case we, we come across another god and we don't want to offend him, so this would be the, the altar or monument to him. Apostle Paul, he took this opportunity, blessed with God's spirit, armed with the word of truth, and he used that to speak about the true and living God who was unknown to them, and it worked out very well. You could tell God had guided him in his thoughts. But Apostle Paul makes a statement in Acts, the 17th chapter, Verse 22, he said, you people are very superstitious. In fact, you're too superstitious. You, you worry too much about what you, you, you know, you're pleasing all these gods and not focusing on what you should be doing. This is what Apostle Paul was dealing with in our, in our chapter, in our text. The, the Greek brethren whom he had left Apollos in charge with were manufacturing or adding things to the truth that shouldn't have been. And you can get that flavor in the, in the few verses before this. Remembering that the truth was new, the knowledge of the truth was new. They had no reference material. You and I come up with a question. We can either call someone or FaceTime them. We can get on the computer and go to how many different websites, Christian Resources or whatever it might be, the Dawn. We, we have it at our fingertips, not counting the vast libraries we have in our homes of all the books. They didn't have that. They depended on the word from those whom were left in charge like Apollos and the Apostle Paul and the letters he wrote. That's all they had. Now, I'm not saying that this condones or makes it any better what they did, but this is, this is what brings us to that point. So Apostle Paul makes this statement. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. In a sense, it's a very small and mild rebuke. You shouldn't be doing this. I would have thought of a lot of different ways to rebuke them, much sterner, more severe, but nonetheless, this is what he did. But as I said, when he said this, he laid out this two-step process, at least in my mind, of how to come into a knowledge of the truth and God giving you that increase. And like I said, something just didn't sit, so I'm going to hold back on that just a little bit. But immediately, he uses that analogy of planting. And that has been endorsed by the Heavenly Father throughout the scriptures. In fact, most of the Old Testament, you will find some form of planting or reference to planting when it comes to the Word of God. And why is that? Why is that? We all have experience in planting. I'm talking about literal planting. How many of us put in a garden? How many of us plant flowers? Everybody, pretty much. I can remember as a child when I first learned of planting. My sisters were older. They really loved me. They were good to me. And they would teach me all kind of little things that my parents, you know, when they were working and they spent more time with me. I was their baby brother and they, you know, they just doted on me and I, I, I miss that so much. But, but, I can remember when they taught me about plants and planting seeds and they call that germination. And I was planting seeds in this mud and the dirt and I'd sprinkle the water on them and I'd put them on the, on the window sills. And before you know it, the whole house was filled with little potted plants with clay in them and eventually my mother would say, that's enough, you know. But... It, it fascinated me because it is a miracle indeed. It's a miracle. And this is what a Paul, Apostle Paul is making the analogy, the connection to the word of God. Everybody knows it. Everybody understands it. 
What was Apostle Paul planting? He was planting the seeds of truth. Now, that is not necessarily scriptural, those very words, the seeds of truth, but there are very similar thoughts, and it is implied throughout the Bible. One of them, my favorite, is, is Psalms, the 126 chapter, verse 6. And it talks, and I think this is directly instructional for our Lord, but it would apply to the household of faith as well. It says, these precious seeds, and that you will come and plant them, but you'll come back and you'll harvest, you'll harvest the, uh, the works, uh, or the, the plants after, something can affect you. Forgive me, I'm not quoting exact. But it talks about the precious seeds, and this is what Apostle Paul was planting. But even according to Apostle Paul's own advice, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I always get these mixed up. I say chapter 4, verse 2, and I mean it's chapter 2, verse 4. But the apostle tells us that it's, it's good in the sight of God that everybody is saved and I'm paraphrasing, and comes to a knowledge of the truth. And that's what King James, that's what I read the King James. That's what King James said. But literally, if you go to the diaglot, to the Greek translation, it means come to an accurate knowledge. So, brother, I ask you a question. If there's accurate knowledge in the world, what does that lead us to believe also? There's inaccurate knowledge. Makes sense. Apostle Paul was giving them accurate knowledge. He was saying, I planted the seeds. He was an apostle. He was authorized by our Lord and the Heavenly Father to plant these wonderful gospel seeds. Paul, Apostle Paul, as I said, was diligent, zealous. He used this, he used this to the fullest. He was, he was not stoppable. He, would, he barely considered his own welfare, and he put his, his, the brethren and this gospel in front of it. And that was, that was really a blessing to us. So then the, the question came up, our Lord preached the gospel, and then the apostles were commissioned to preach the gospel. Are they the only ones that were allowed to plant these seeds? And the answer is, of course, no. And we are all familiar with that scripture in Isaiah chapter 61. What's it say? I am anointed by the, by the Holy Spirit to preach the good tidings, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Everybody, according to Isaiah's words, which is inspired by God, everybody who has been anointed. And what is that anointing? That's that increase that Apostle Paul was talking about that come from God. Everybody that has that increase has a commission. It's a duty. And what is that duty? To preach the good times, to bind up the brokenhearted. We don't consider it work, do we? We consider it a pleasure. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to be able to speak that word. There's a lot of scriptures that support that. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6 says, Hear and increase. Matthew 12, 34, Luke 6, 45, basically the same. It says, Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. God gives us the understanding, but he gives it to us in what manner? In an abundance. Why do you think he does that? Because we have so much to give. You don't want to hold it back. You have more than enough. Your cup runs over. You want to, you want to spread it to everybody else. Therefore, it allows you to do that commission in, in Isaiah. We know that the privilege, there is a privilege of spreading this word to those who will hear it. The use of planting of the seeds is a great analogy as well. Every time that you plant a seed, you can picture this in your mind, whether it be a, a, a seed for tomato plants or a seed for a cherry tree or an oak tree, whatever type of plant it is. That seed starts out small. And over time, over time, and I stress that, over time, that seed will germinate and grow into something spectacular. Take a look sometime on your phone or, or on your computer of the grain of a mustard seed. It's amazing how big one of those plants can get. That's such a good comparison to the truth and as well as our faith. None of us can receive that abundance all at once. We have to get a little bit of time. I love the scripture. It says, line by line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. I think that's just so, so poignant. I just, that touches my heart. Because that's exactly how God has laid this plan out for you and I to know and for anybody to know. I wondered if there was one seed that was better than another to plant. 
You know, the gospel has many facets. We've seen that today. Look at how many different talks we had. And they all connected together, not by coincidence, but they all had different thoughts, but they all tied together to this one common purpose, and that's God's eternal will. Is there one better than the other in my witness effort, I wonder? You know, we think about understanding the ransom. That's a big one. Um, the truth about hell. Wouldn't you love to go and explain the truth about hell to any and everybody that you meet? But the opportunity doesn't come up that way. The truth about God and his individuality. There is no trinity. God lives, he is, exists by himself and his son Jesus is indeed his son. Those are all wonderful, precious seeds of the truth. We'd, and, but I'm just wondering, which would be better for an initial witness effort to someone? I think the Lord said it best in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse 19. He's talking to the apostles and he's saying, if they don't accept the kingdom, then walk away, turn your back on them because they, they won't accept anything else. So I think that if it be our opportunity, because our witness efforts are always dependent on the situation, whether it be a funeral home or a wedding or, or you're sitting on a park bench or maybe a fellow worker, it always depends on the situation as to what we have to offer as far as a witness. So we can't say this is the only time we should always do this. But I think the Lord's message is if you steer it towards the kingdom, think about that. You steer the discussion towards the kingdom, now you've opened up the thought to resurrection. Now you've opened up the thought to salvation for all. It's a great fundamental starting point, isn't it? I can't disagree. And the Lord supports that. And of course, you're keeping true with Isaiah's commission in 61. Okay, so we've covered the planting Apostle Paul was talking about, the planting of the seeds. We've covered that enough. So let's move on to the next step. And that was, he said, Apollos watered. And Apollos was elected as an elder in these Greek brethren uh, uh, in the ecclesias that they belong to. And obviously, Apostle Paul saw some things in him that, that were good. As any gardener knows, anybody that's ever planted a seed knows anything about germination. You plant the seed, and that's, not, that's far from the end of it. That's just the beginning of it, isn't it? Now you have to nurture that seed. That seed is going to take care. It's going to take sunlight. It's going to take good ground. But more importantly, it's going to take water. Water is that nutrient that it needs to grow. So how would watering apply to the seeds of truth, to the gospel, and to you and I? And I thought about this for a moment, but it became very clear. And, and I saw a lot of it today. I saw a lot of it today. Follow up. If you are privileged enough to plant a seed with someone, then the watering would be the follow-up discussions you may have the privilege of having. And those follow-ups might be in the order of proving what you just said. I'm going to tell you about the kingdom. Now I'm going to tell you, you know, that it says, as in Adam all die, but as in Christ all be made alive. It's a good scripture. How about the one when it, it says that uh, all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Lord and come forth. That's a good scripture. You should be armed with these scriptures ahead of time for the watering of the seed that you planted. And even if we don't get that opportunity to water, and maybe we do it for somebody else, you know, somebody else has an opportunity and we come in and, and we should be watering that same seed, as well as being ready to offer some other seeds, but one step at a time, a little bit at a time, let that seed uh, be nurtured a little bit and give them the chance to let it germinate. But we should be ready. And even if we don't get that opportunity, we should be ready and equipped with the sword of truth that if we have the opportunity, we offer to them. But we, all, we should never go in and just scatter the seeds on the ground and walk away. That's, it's just as important, according to Apostle Paul, to water these seeds as it is to plant them. So we have to keep that in mind. So now we've discussed the, the planting, the watering, Who can have these seeds and who can have this increase? Natural question. Now, in the book of Matthew, the apostles asked the Lord a very specific saying, a very specific question. And it got me thinking, and I appreciated the, the one discourse uh, that said that 
Matthew is not necessarily chronological, and I appreciate that because I was not under that impression. So I'm going I'm to amend my statement just a little bit and add this in. But in Matthew, the 13th chapter, the apostles asked the Lord, why do you teach in parables? Why do you teach in these dark sayings? Now, remember, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They did not have the increase at that point. They didn't know. But yet it was, it was a manner in which Jesus taught, and they were almost asking, and I don't think I'm too far off with this. They were almost asking him, is this truth? Are this, is this gospel that you're talking about just for a certain group? Is it being hid from everybody? And they were asking this innocently. On that subject, just a few chapters before, which I thought maybe happened before, but maybe I'm wrong, it happened after, I'm not sure. Uh, but in se chapter 7, verses 7 and 8 of Matthew, the Lord gave them the answer. He gave them the answer, and I definitely want to read that for you. And I know this is, you're familiar with it. It's something we're all familiar with, but this has such impact on what we're talking about. And the Lord said in verse 7 of chapter 7, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find it. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Verse 8, For everyone that asketh, for everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So we realize that there is no special group that God has reserved this for. The simple fact is you have to ask for that increase, brother. It doesn't just happen because a seed has been planted and it's been nurtured. You, the individual that receives that seed, has to ask God for that help. Simple. Simple. You remember the parable in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, 3 through 9? We know it as the parable of the sower. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Now, when we remember this and we read this, we have to realize what we've already established in prior study, that the soil... The dirt that these seeds were sown on isn't talking about literal dirt. It's talking about the heart conditions of mankind. And I would consider these four groups as, I guess the word would be comprehensive. Would that be the correct word? It's exa ex exhausted. There's no more, there's no, they may fit into one of these categories or close to it, but there's no more other headings that it would fit into. The, the conditions of man's heart in this world today. The first, some of these seeds fell from the sower's pouch, and they fell onto the ground. Does anybody remember what happened? Some of the birds came and ate them, and what was left? The wind blew them away. Now, to me, that describes someone who has a character, a heart condition, that has no interest in a creator, has no interest in a God, or any forms of that. Not necessarily even just the gospel, the accurate knowledge, but any form. Then it says the stony ground. Some seeds were dropped on the stony ground. Everybody knows uh, stony ground. For those of us who have maybe a decorative stone around our house, this baffles me. It baffles me. Every year, I cut the grass, and a little bit of the clippings go in there, and, I, and my stones around the flowers in the, in the garden, not so much the garden, but around the edging of the house. And every year, I'm down on my knees pulling little pieces of grass out that have rooted. And it, 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 I don't know where it comes from. I guess there's seeds that I spit out by the lawnmower. But nonetheless, the point is that they're not big enough to grow. They, there's not enough dirt for them to grow. Okay. And it, they pull out very easily. And it doesn't happen year-round. It's just, you know, once in a while. I'm making, I'm, I'm embellishing. But with that said, these seem to be the type of people with the heart condition that say, well, thank you. Thank you for that kind word. And I appreciate it but really doesn't seem to go anywhere. Doesn't seem to go anywhere. And I'm talking about the gospel falling on their ears. That's just the type of uh, soil that their heart is. I'm not judging them. I'm saying, I'm just making the correspondence to what the Lord has said. The thorny ground. We're all familiar with the thorny ground. Make no mistake, thorny ground is actually good soil. The problem is there's something growing on it. 
and it's, it hurts you, it, it's injurious to you. Okay, since we're on the subject of working in my yard, every summer when it gets nice, Sister Cindy gives me some advice. And some of it I take, some of it I don't. Sorry, honey. I, she says, put your work boots on because I have an old pair of sneakers and there's a bit of a hillside on our side of our house. And if I get on there with my sneakers, I'll slide down and fall and sometime may fall, fall into peril, although I haven't. But I put my work boots on. But inevitably, the one I always forget is I'm on this hillside and I'm dug in with my feet and there is a type of prickly weed that grows. I don't know if it's na uh, just natural to Pennsylvania, I'm not sure. But it has these little spines on the stem all the way up. And they're, 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 it's pretty to look at, but they hurt. And every time I go out there and I don't have my gloves on and I try to pull these out. And I, I, sometimes I think I'm gonna outsmart them and I reach down to the root, but inevitably I come up with all these little pricklies in my hand and it hurts. So I actually should be taking the advice of my wife. But that's that thorny ground. It hurts to take it out. Doesn't mean it can't come out. And that to me is the epitome of what we talked about earlier. Inaccurate knowledge. Perfect example of inaccurate knowledge. There's a lot of that going around. There's a lot of that in the world today. There's very little of the accurate knowledge. God does not restrict his gospel from anybody. And if you look at this example of the parable of the sower, notice something. It stands out to you. Those seeds fell on every type of ground. So it's not for you and I to judge whom gets this truth, whom, whom we offer these seeds to. It's up to God. Now, of course, there are circumstances where you wouldn't, and it says it in Matthew 7, chapter, you don't cast your pearl before swine, but we have to be very careful with that, that we aren't prejudging people as to if they deserve this gospel or not. We just give it and let the Lord decide. I think that's the safest bet. But he doesn't restrict it from anybody. Anybody who gets that and asks for that increase will receive it according to the scriptures. So in answer to that question, when I said at the beginning, we put that on the shelf, I didn't quite get, something was amiss a when I read what Apostle Paul had said. He planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase, but God gave the increase. There was something wrong with it, and it was, I now know what it is. It was simple. It was right in, staring me in the face. It's not a two-step process. It's a three-step process. The seeds fall. The watering, the nurturing comes. Then the individual asks for God's help to understand, and then God gives the increase. And it doesn't matter how they come to the seeds. You can say, well, Brother George, there's a lot of people that, that read literature. There's a lot of people that have gotten it from the Bible. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. They may have come across the seeds on their own. It doesn't mean that somebody has to dispense them. They may have watered it themselves with research and looking into the scriptures on their own. It doesn't matter. But what does matter is that they ask God for his uh, advice and his wisdom, and God and only God gives that increase. And it made so much sense once I realized that. So much sense. So I asked myself, I asked myself, how come I was so lucky? How come I'm so privileged to have come into a knowledge of this truth, come out of this darkness of the world and coming into this marvelous light? Many of you know my family. Uh, we all dwelled in the land of Balco, up in Pittsburgh area. Some of you may have visited, some maybe not. Um, I asked myself, is it because my parents were of a, a household of faith where they were consecrated? Did I come to it because of that? Did I come to it because many of my uncles and aunts planted these seeds every day of our lives since we grew up? Well, the scriptures tell us the truth. Acts, the 10th chapter, verse 34 says, God is no respecter of persons. So it can't be for my genetics. It's not because of my parents or my family that I came into this truth, that I was blessed with an increase. Couldn't be. It also says that there are none righteous, no, not one. So it wasn't my background. It wasn't my genetics. So I pondered this for years, and I spoke to some brother. Now, this was many years ago. I've, I've come to the understanding more recently. But I asked some brother, why is it that I, I have this truth? Why is it? I was still searching, still proving the truth to myself. Some said that 
God saw a spark in me. And I realized, brother, when someone says that spark, then they really don't have a good answer. <laughs> They're just covering up what they don't know. That's just the truth, as I know now and I'm an adult. The truth is, 1 Corinthians 1st chapter, verse 26 through 29, God says, there is, no, uh, the Apostle Paul says, there is no glory in man. No glory in man. There's nothing you, I, you and I can do that we can take glory in. We can't, because it just doesn't exist. Then I had another brother tell me what, well, it must be the way we study. There again, that would be self-glorification. I cannot do that. I don't have that privilege. I don't have that right. I am no better than the next person. I am no better than the next person. Second Chronicles. Now, I, I didn't write it down, so forgive me. It's either the first or second chapter, but you can find this. It says that God's eyes are constantly running to and fro on the earth. And he's looking for something. And what is that? He's looking for the heart that is perfect towards him. Perfect towards him. It took me a long while, but I finally realized, and I have a better understanding of what perfect is. And I'm going to pass that on to you. If you look up the word perfect in the dictionary, you know what it says? Complete. God is looking for the heart that's complete or completely towards him. That's all it is. It's simple. It's not hidden. It's not under ceremonies and bells and whistles. It's right there, right there. Hebrews 11th chapter, verse 6, I quote this so often. It's impossible to please God without faith, but what else does it say? God is the rewarder of those whom diligently seek him. Look up that word diligent in the Greek dictionary. You know what it is? It means to crave. God is going to give that Wisdom, that increase to those who crave it, those who desire it. Proverbs 26, 23, 26 says, give me thine heart and observe my ways. But this, one of the best ones is by Psalmist David, 40, 42nd chapter, verses 1 and 2. He said, and he puts it in such a poetic way. He says, he's talking to the Heavenly Father. He says, Father, my, my, my soul pants for you like a panting dog, like a panting animal. It pants for you. My soul thirsts for you. That's a beautiful thought, but that's, that's what it takes. That's the desire of God. It's so simple. It's a heart condition. In understanding this basic, sim simple, fundamental truth that's easy, that I started out to say was easy, understanding this makes so much uh, available to us to understand. It, it explains why Apostle Paul said these words, this statement, I have planted a Paul's word and God gives the increase. It explains that. You see, I'm going to paraphrase it for you, so forgive me, but I'm going to put it in my own words. Apostle Paul was saying, listen, I am an apostle and I have done everything I can do for you. And I have made sure and other peoples have made sure that you got the understanding that you've been watered, you've been nurtured, and we have given you supportive scriptures. I can't do any more. Now it's up to you to ask the Heavenly Father, to bless you with that understanding. And then God will give the increase. So it's a three-step process, brother. We are running out of time quickly. It seems to be the trend of the day. So I promised my wife, Sister Cindy, that I would close on time. I had come across this, and I will at least take this much time. It won't take long. I come across a really beautiful sentiment, a beautiful thought. And I'm going to pass it on to you. I actually had what they say, an aha moment. Aha! It was like a light bulb went off over my head. And it has to do with this very subject that we're talking about. It was some time ago, and, and you may have heard about this from other brethren. This is no secret. This is nothing new, but I'm going to detail for you. The details may be a little bit new. But it's still, it's a, it's a subject that has been spoken by the brother before. It was an article written in the New York Times in the year 2008. And it was about an archaeological excavation that was going to take place in the year 1960. And the site was called Masada. Maybe some of us have visited it. Maybe some of us have heard of it. Now, Masada is an is a area in the Judean Desert in the land of Israel. I don't know how far it is from Jerusalem, but it's in that area. 
And they knew to dig there because there was records showing that the Herod at the time, the Herod was the, the ruler of that area, at the time, 35 years before our Lord was born, 35 years before our Lord was born, he built a fortress there. So they were going to unearth earth, earth this fortress to scientifically look and see what was left behind. So they start digging in their little shovels and hammers and their helmets and however they do it in the hot sun. And it was a couple of weeks into it. And they made an amazing discovery, something truly amazing. And that amazing discovery was they found some seeds in one of the compartments. And those seeds, seeds were date palm seeds. So dates come, the dates that you eat, the sweet fruits, I guess, come from a palm tree, a form of a palm tree. And they found these seeds. But what is amazing is that these seeds were 2,000 years old and they were still intact. They had not rotted away. So that is amazing. But this presented them with a dilemma back in 1960. They didn't know what to do with it. If they study them scientifically, then they have to break them open and destroy them to see what they, their research finds inside. So he says, okay, we're going to take one of these seeds. We'll break it open and see what it is. And they agreed it was a date palm seed. They agreed that it was um, intact and it was over 2,000 years old. So their, their, their suspicions were confirmed and this was amazing. But that's where they left it. 45 years later, according to this article, 45 years later, a whole new generation um, of, it was actually two women uh, archaeologists, got this information. He says, okay, we're going to proceed with this information. So they, they agreed that, well, seeds are made, made to be planted. So let's plant some. But they were so scarce, there was only a few of them. They only planted three of them. Now, remembering that germination takes usually about a, uh, five to seven days. They planted them in all the best situations. They watered them. They had them under lights. One week went by, nothing. Two weeks, three weeks, nothing. Four weeks, five weeks, nothing. They were starting to get discouraged. Six weeks went by, what do you think happened? One of those seeds sprouted. They were elated. They were um, uh, beyond belief. Now, the article finished. That was in 2005 when they planted them and one sprouted. The article finished by saying in 2008 when they wrote this article, that tree, that sprouting, had grown to a tree about three feet tall. Now, I didn't follow up on it recently, but I think it would be worthwhile to look. I'm curious as to if that tree is still in existence and if it's still growing. But my enthusiasm was for other things, and I'm going to make it real clear, and I promise you I'll hurry up. How many seeds do you think have been planted that fell dormant during this gospel age, the seeds of truth. Think about it, our Lord. He spoke to 4,000 and 5,000 in different cases. That was just the men. There was no great influx of brethren come in at that time. The apostles, Apostle Paul, missionary journeys. How many thousands of seeds do you think he planted that lay dormant? All the way up through this gospel age to you and I. How many seeds have you had the privilege of planting? How many have grown and you've seen yield an increase by God? How many? It's a few. It's a few. Praise to our Heavenly Father. This, this article really opened my eyes because God is not wasting anything. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little excited. God will not waste anything. He has not wasted his seeds and he will not waste our efforts. Those seeds that you and I and any brother who has had that increase down through the ages has planted, isn't going to rot. It's just dormant. Just waiting for the circumstances. And when are those circumstances going to happen? Soon. Soon. When the Lord comes and his church is filled, and we pray that we are part of that, but whatever part we are given is a blessing. And when all the, the encumbrances of mankind are lifted, when Satan is, is bound and that, those weedy soils and those thorny soils and all become good soil and the rain is poured and man's heart will turn to God, those seeds are going to germinate. 
the seeds are going to germinate. What a blessing. What a, what a privilege we have, brethren, that the work we're doing now may really sprout into something spectacular. Credit to God, not to us. And it seems to me that the same process, this three-step process, is going to be the same thing in the kingdom. That they're going to receive the seeds, however. They're going to have it nurtured, watered, however. But their hearts are going to have to turn to God and ask him for the increase. And we know that from the, it's implied in Micah, the fourth chapter, verse two. What's that say? Come, let us go. Come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Let's go and get those same blessings. And it's all beginning because of the grace of God and the glory he gave his son unto the church. And finally, brother, and I am going to close. We're going to close on one thought. And it comes to us, and you're all familiar with this, it comes to us in the book of Genesis, chapter 22. And this will be fulfilled at the end of the kingdom, and we so look forward to that. But it was that promise to Abraham God had given. He said, Abraham, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Amen.